right, just going to let folks start filtering into the webinar. Hey. Andy says hi, Barbara. He's right next to me. Hey, how's he doing? How are you doing, Andy? I hope whatever you had is all behind you. Thanks. It's great. He's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Morgan, and I'm an event manager here at Politics and Prose. And I'd like to welcome you all to PNP Live. Soon, I will drop a link in the chat where you can order a copy of How Civil Wars Start and How to Stop Them straight from PNP's website. You can click. You can ask our speakers a question this afternoon by clicking on the Q and A button at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try to get to as many of those questions as we can towards the event, end of the program. But we apologize in advance if we don't have time to address your question. Also, there are auto captions for this event by hitting the live caption button at the bottom of your screen. Let's introduce our guests. Barbara F. Walter is the Rohr Professor, Professor in International Relations at the University of California, San Diego. A life member of the Council on Foreign Relations, Walter runs the award-winning blog, Political Violence at a Glance, and has written for the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, Reuters, and Foreign Affairs. Walter will be in conversation with Anne-Marie Slaughter, the CEO of New America and the Burt G. Ker Curse Litter, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, 66 University Professor Emerita of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton University. Her books include Renewal from, Cri from Crisis to Transformation in Our Lives, Work and Politics, and The Idea That Is America, Keeping Face with Our Values in a Dangerous World. Let's give our guests a virtual round of applause. So Barbara, I've been looking forward uh, to this conversation and I will say to everybody listening that this was a book that I had the uh, pleasure of, of reading in advance just before publication. And it's a book that I found hard to put down in the sense that it's the, the stories and the writing are incredibly engaging. The message is pretty terrifying and I kept thinking, yeah, this is this is really interesting, but it's about other countries. It's not about the United States. Uh, and that is exactly what you want to convince us is wrong. <laughs> and by the end of the by end, the end of the book, I really I did have a different view. And I hope in this conversation uh, we can sort of walk people through the various uh, steps that you describe as to how civil wars do start. Uh, and then we will talk a little bit about where we are now and open it to uh, audience questions. But I have to start, as, as these conversations often do, by asking you why you wrote it. But even before that, in the introduction, you say you were interested in civil wars in 1990. And that's really early. You know, if you had said 1995, I would have said, yeah, Yugoslavia was falling apart and you could already tell that the end of the Cold War was gonna be really uh, a kind of cosmic event in terms of domestic upheaval. But 1990 is, is before that. It's just, we're just ending uh, the Cold War. So I wanna ask you why the interest in civil war to begin with, and then why this book now? Yeah, so I started grad school at the University of Chicago. That's where I met Anne-Marie <laughs> so many yeah. years ago um, in 1989, uh, which as Anne-Marie said, was this, was this moment in time when people suspected that there was maybe transformational change happening, but we really didn't know. It could easily just have gone back to the Cold War. Uh, and in my field, which was international security, and especially at the University of Chicago, um, people who studied security studied a uh, great power conflict, and in particular, um, the conflict between the, the United States and the Soviet Union, and they worried mostly about thermonuclear war. Um, and I was, you know, young, I, I wasn't, I don't know why I wasn't particularly interested in that. Um, I, you know, but I, I've always read the paper voraciously, and I was reading the paper back then, and you started to hear about these small wars that no one was talking about. Um, Somalia, 
the Balkans, um, Rwanda, but in the early, early stages. And, and I was frustrated by the coverage. Um, everything I read seemed very simplistic. It, it made the same argument, these wars are breaking out because different ethnic groups hate each other. They're always hate each other. They will continue to hate each other. So there's really nothing interesting about these cases. It's just ethnic groups fighting. The one thing I knew at the time was of all the countries in Africa, Somalia was the only one that was ethnically homogeneous. So it didn't make sense that it, it, was, it had one of these wars and it was a very long-standing war. And in fact, in some respects, it's still going on today. And I just, I just wanted to understand why these small wars were happening. And then I very quickly realized that they were also, they lasted longer. They were harder to resolve. Um, more people were killed in them. And so then I, you know, then I thought, wow, if I really care about peace, and that has motivated everything I've done. I have a huge painting in my office, and all it says is peace. You know, if I really care about peace, then we have to understand why these wars are breaking out. And, and unfortunately for the world, um, we've only see, seen them increase over time. Interesting, and it, so you, you. One of the things that is so striking, uh, and that follows from what you just said, was when you look at these civil wars, and the book ranges really widely, I mean, from Africa to the Philippines to the Balkans to to Syria. I mean, you really have have shown us a, a kind of global canvas of civil conflict. Um, you say there's a script. Uh, which is which is really striking because I think it's it's often I remember I certainly remember when the uh, Balkans wars in the 1990s broke out. Robert Kaplan was like, oh yes, you know the Serbs and the Croats and the and the Kosovars have been at each other's throats for centuries and centuries. There's nothing you can do, <clears throat> and you are pushing back against this ethnic determinism, which yeah. I. I, I agree with for many reasons, but instead you say, no, you know, there are patterns here. That's what political scientists do. They look for patterns. Yeah. So what I want us to do in the next, you know, 20 minutes or so is to just sort of talk through the steps of that script. And, yeah. but I want to start by asking you, what's, what's an anocracy? Anocracy. Yeah. A -N -O <laughs> because you start there, you say, you know, yeah. you, the, the, the dangers of anocracy. Yeah, so Anne-Marie, I never thought I would be studying my own country. I never thought I would write a book about civil wars that included the United States. And I'll tell you why I did. So back in 2017, I was invited to be on a task force run by the US government called the Political Instability Task Force. Um, and I was on that through the end of 2021. And the goal of the task force, which has been around since 1994, um, again, early when, when civil wars started breaking out around the world, the US government put together this task force. They asked the members of the task force to come up with a predictive model that would help them predict where around the world governments were likely to become unstable and potentially experience civil war. Um, and I assume the government wanted this because they wanted to see if it was if this country was strategically important to the United States, if this was a country they wanted to boost up, or if this was a country actually that would benefit from some sort of political change. So we sat around and we thought about what were all the possible factors that could potentially increase the risk of civil war. What do all the studies say? Um, and every year we update this. Um, and so the model included over 30 factors. It included poverty, income inequality, um, how ethnically heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneous a country was, <laughs> um, how big it was. I mean, everything we could think of. And only two factors came out um, highly predictive. And none of us expected that. Um, and we tried everything to, to try to get rid of these factors to see if, 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 if there was you know, something wrong with the model and they are solid. The first is, as you said, what we call an anocracy. 
Um, that's a fancy political science term for a government that's neither fully democratic nor fully autocratic. It's something in the middle. So, um, and again, you can have um, anocracies that are on sort of towards democracies. They have more democratic features and a few autocratic features. You could have anocracies that are they're, they're tending much more towards autocracies. They, they have, for example, free elections, but um, the same party wins again and again and again. Um, so, uh, you know, that's the, that's the first factor. We know historically by looking at all these other cases that full, healthy, strong democracies almost never experience civil war. We also know that full, strong autocracies also rarely experience civil war. It's everything in the middle. There's something about this middle zone that makes countries vulnerable to violence. So then the second factor was equally important and that was whether the citizens in these countries began to organize themselves politically, not around ideology, not around sort of left the left right spectrum or not even around a big ideology like communism or liberalism or something else, but whether they were organizing politically around identity, <clears throat> racial, ethnic, or religious lines. And the task force calls this ethnic factionalism. So the country is breaking down into ethnic factions. And so I'm on this task force. I'm sitting, you know, uh, you know, on these weekends in Washington, DC, we're talking about countries in Africa or Central Asia, we're talking about countries all over the place. And of course, I start to see these two factors emerge here in the United States. And so what do we know today? Um, this anocracy variable, this, it, it comes from a nonprofit group called the Center for Systemic Peace. They have various measures of democracy um, and um, the, it's, it's, a, it's called the polity scale that rates countries from negative 10 to positive 10, positive 10 most democratic, negative 10 most autocratic, and between negative five and positive five is this anocracy zone. So in 2016, the US was downgraded for the first time from a positive 10 to a positive eight. In 2019, it was downgraded again to a 27 uh, to to a plus seven, and then by the end of the Trump administration, it was downgraded for the first time to a positive five, um, and it hasn't been there since 1800. So so here I am. I'm watching the the downgrading of our democracy into a zone that I know is is dangerous. Most Americans weren't even aware that this was happening. This again, if you were to go to Hungary or to Turkey or to um, Brazil or to India today, and if you were to ask them, has your democracy declined over the last 10 years? Most citizens would say, no. In fact, I'm happier with my democracy today than I was 10 years ago. But the reality is they've all declined dramatically and citizens often don't realize it. And then, um, yeah, so let ahead. me stop you there for a second. So give us a sense, though, of what are the factors that are that are used to measure this decline? Because I'm yeah. thinking about uh, I'm certainly thinking about various things that the Trump administration did that no mm. administration has tried to do for a very long time. Yeah. But the, the the counterclaim often is, yes, but, you know, the American system pushed back, you know, the, the in fact, the Mueller administration, the Mueller investigation was allowed to proceed to its conclusion, yeah. you know, that he didn't yeah. do anything to the Supreme Court. So what kind of factors are there? Yeah, so um, the polity scale looks at four factors in particular. One of them is um, constraints on the executive, um, which is essentially how powerful is the presidency relative to other branches of government. And our executive branch has been becoming more powerful than any other branch in, in government um, before Trump. So you could, America's democracy was, was weakening beforehand. In fact, Arthur Schlesinger, the historian, many years ago already called the US presidency an imperial presidency. 
So the main check, uh, Anne Marie, correct me if, if your if your listeners already know this, and I'm, I'm boring them, but the main check on the pre on the executive branch here in the United States is Congress, is the legislative branch, and one of their main controls on a rogue president is um, the subpoena. And so one of the reasons why, for example, polity downgraded the United States' democracy in 2019 was because the White House refused to hand over documents to Congress. It refused um, to um, uh, um, uh, comply with, with the subpoenas. And the president actually counseled um, members of his administration not to not to respond. That's concerning. What was more concerning and what really visibly showed the weakness of the legislature compared to the executive branch is that the Republicans in Congress acceded to this. So they essentially said, you know, we are not going to act as a check on the president. We are, we are simply going to support whatever the president does, even if they're if 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 he's actually um, behaving in a way that's undemocratic. So that was one of the reasons it was downgraded. Another reason why the US was downgraded in 2016 had to do with our elections. Um, you know, there were international monitors here in the United States in 2016, like there always are, and they deemed that election free, but not entirely fair. Um, and that had that had partly to do with the fact that unlike, as far as I know, almost any other liberal democracy in the world, our parties control how, how local elections are, are run and how votes are counted. This is like, this is inconceivable to some, somebody who lives in Denmark or Switzerland or, or Canada. Um, you know, true democracies have an independent commission that's in charge of running elections. And the effect of that is, is that that citizens have more faith in the system, more trust in the system. They trust that there aren't going to be these shenanigans um, and, and they trust that the, that the votes will be counted and, and the result will, will reflect what the people want, not what the parties want. So I could go into more detail, but it's, it's things like that. So, so that's helpful, and I know we'll come back to the U.S., but I, I want to make sure that people get a chance to hear the result of, of all the work you've done on other countries. So you talk about an anocracy, you talk about the rise of factions, and they're not ideological factions, they're ethnic factions and very, or identity-based yeah. factions, and we'll, we'll come back to that. But then you, you have a very interesting set of a couple of chapters where you talk about the, the kind of losing status and losing yeah. hope. And I wanted to, so that there's a kind of slow slide or maybe a fast slide, but talk about what, what that looks like in different yeah. countries, it's both losing status yeah. and losing hope. Yeah, so there's this really interesting and rich scholarship, um, uh, mostly in political science, that looks very carefully at all of the ethnic conflicts that have happened. Um, and the, the question is, you know, who's, you know, once you do have societies breaking down into ethnic factions, who tends to start these wars? Um, and the results are, again, interesting and unexpected. I think most people, if you ask them, who, you know, what group in society is likely to, to pick up a gun first, they would say it's the poorest groups in society, or it's the most downtrodden, the most discriminated against, the most oppressed immigrants, perhaps. And what these studies have shown is no, these groups generally aren't the ones who start the wars, and, and they generally don't start the wars because they are weak, they are oppressed. Um, it is hard for them to organize. The groups that tend to start these wars are what the literature calls sons of the soil, sons of the soil. I know that sounds like a biker group. <laughs> um, <laughs> sons of the soil. So it's, it's, it's groups that had once been dominant politically, economically, culturally, but are in decline. They've either lost power or they anticipate that they're going to, to lose power. Um, and it's these groups that, that truly believe that the country is theirs, um, that, that they have a rightful stake to the country because they were there first or because they've been the majority for so long. 
Um, they're the ones who feel this deep sense of resentment um, if they're losing relative to other groups. They, they, deep, they feel this loss of status um, and they have often still have enough power and protection and privilege to organize um, without, without being um, repressed. And I'll, I'll give you <clears throat> some examples. Um, uh, there's a group in, in the Southern Philippines called the Maros. They are, they are Muslim. Um, if you look back over 100 years ago, um, they were the vast majority of a region called Mindanao. And they had, they, they, prior to um, being colonized, they had um, run, they had been independent. Their, their leaders were, you know, chose, uh, you know, they were run, they ran themselves. Then they became part of the Philippines and the Philippines is majority Catholic. And the North of, of the Philippines is highly populated. And the government saw this, uh, this rich territory in Mindanao, it was sparsely populated. And they said, wow, you know, if we give Catholics incentives to move down there, we can one, capture those resources, and two, we can kind of politically bring Mindanao under control. And so you had this vast migration of Catholics from the North into the South to the point where most of the areas of Mindanao today are um, majority Catholic. And of course the Muslims saw first their political position um, decline and then lose it entirely. Then they saw their land being taken away. And then they saw that the, the settlers from the North were doing better economically than them. And there was this deep resentment and they tried to work within the system. Um, they would go to Manila, they would try to run for office, they would vote in elections, but they couldn't compete against the, the increasingly popu populous Catholics and they and then extremists within their group eventually said to hell with this. The only way we we have any chance to maintain control is to pick up a gun and fight. So, so it's interesting. So you you point out and and I, I was thinking as you were talking that you can tell the same story about the Serbs who who had you know a, a particular kind of power under Tito, even though, as you point out, it, it had been distributed. And of course, once it comes apart, they, they, they see themselves losing and there, there are other examples. Yeah. But you point out that they did try to work yeah. within the system. And so is that the losing hope part that, they, that these groups try very hard to play the, play the game by the rules, but then decide the game is just irrevocably stacked against them? Yeah, and, and I think a helpful way to think about this is not to think about these unhappy groups as monolithic. Um, they're really comprised of elites. You know, let's think about these. These are the individuals who um, want political power. They want to lead the group. Um, uh, you know, they're the ones who have a vision for, for what um, the, you know, a new country might, might look like. And then there's just average citizens. Um, who <clears throat> who do have grievances? They they see that things are not going well for them, um, but but they you know would they they wouldn't necessarily think that violence <laughs> is the way to go. They're the poor schmucks who are going to pay the costs of war, right? And and likely not um, enjoy many of the benefits. And so what you often see is you have these uh, people we call ethnic entrepreneurs. They're oftentimes politicians. Um, Milosevic was an ethnic entrepreneur. Um, and they figure out that if they can play on people's fears and insecurities, that they can get at the average citizen, not only su to support them in their quest for power, but if they can scare them enough, they can actually convince them um, that violence is the only means to achieve their goal. And Milosevic was an absolute master of this. Um, one of the things most people don't know is that Milosevic wasn't, wasn't a nationalist um, by naturally, he was a communist. Um, and he was a party communist during the Soviet era. And all he wanted to do is maintain power. Soviet Union collapses. You suddenly have Yugoslavia 
um, has the opportunity to rapidly democratize, Milosevic suddenly realizes if he's going to stay in power, he has to face competitive elections. He knows that Yugoslavs hate communists and they, <laughs> he knows that they know that he's a communist. Um, you know, he, and, he's, and, and he's desperately trying to figure out what is his hook going to be. And he's smart and he's strategic. And he realizes that the largest ethnic group in Yugoslavia are the Serbs. And if he could somehow convince the Serbs that they have to vote for an ethnic Serb, and if they don't, the Croats are gonna take power and the Croats are planning to shut them out of power. And in fact, they might even be planning to murder them the way they murdered them in World War II. If he can convince average Serbs that this is reality, then they will go and support him lockstep because they fear that anything else will leave them and their families um, in danger. And so you see this again and again, Modi in India is an ethnic entrepreneur. Bolsonaro in Brazil is an ethnic entrepreneur. Duterte in the Philippines is an ethnic entrepreneur. And of course, Trump um, has followed all of these individuals. He's looked at their playbook. He's an ethnic entrepreneur as well. So, so interesting, you, you, so ethnic, uh, it doesn't have to be racial, right? It doesn't have to, it, 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 it's some kind of divide that is tied to identity. Because if you think about, yeah. I mean, Trump, yes, is certainly playing on white identity, but he's also playing on male identity. Yeah. He's yeah. playing on, on kind of, you've been ripped off that, that sense, as you say, of, of grievance, but it's people who manipulate divisions that are tied to some kind of immutable trait. Um, and what you see, and you described this, you know, a place like Sarajevo, everybody, everybody lived together, everybody yeah. intermarried. So it was yeah. like, it couldn't possibly happen here. And suddenly it's like tapping a, you know, a chisel into a rock and you yeah. see the cracks uh, yeah. split. And of course, one of the really important tools that ethnic entrepreneurs have to utilize is the media. You know, propaganda becomes really, really important because they have to capture the narrative. They, they have to create a message of fear and distrust and threat. And, and you see that Milosevic controlled um, essentially state radio and state television, and he just continuously pumped out a message um, that was ab about the, you know, the Croats um, organizing. If there was any sort of event where, where um, you know, the Croats did, um, for example, target a, a Serb, that was, that was hugely exaggerated to help prove Milosevic's point. If you look in Rwanda prior to the genocide there, I mean, the Hutus and Tutsis are, are indistinguishable. Um, you cannot tell the difference between them. And of course, one of the things that happened is, is that Hutus in power forced people to have identity cards. Um, and it, it essentially crafted that identity. It was almost like, you know, doing the Holocaust, forcing people, you know, to wear, um, you know, a yellow star to, or, or, or a Nazi insignia, right? It's, it's crafting um, and make, trying to make, you know, identity issues obvious and, and big. And, and the, the Hutus, the, the extremists within the Hutu party who organized the genocide, one of the first things they did was to put up, you know, radio towers and just continuously 24 seven, just spew a message of, you know, the cockroaches are coming there. The cockroaches are organizing. They, they, you know, they want your, you, they want your land. They want your, your wife, you know, and, and, you know, you better be, you better be ready. And, and if you don't kill them first, they're going to kill you. And so propaganda is a really important tool. And you see that again and again, you know, across cases, Bolsonaro, Modi, Trump, Duterte are also absolutely masterful with social media, more so than any other politician. If you, if you watch how they catapulted themselves to power, they catapulted themselves to power because they were the first politicians in their countries who really invested in, um, in um, messaging via social media while everybody else was still doing you know, traditional campaigning. And, and it was very effective for all of them.
All right. So we've we've sort of walked through a number of steps. You have uh, you know a declining democracy, or for that matter, a declining autocracy, but a country that some, suddenly is in between, that is not strongly one or the other. You have the ra- rise of factions, identity-based factions. Yeah. Uh, you have this sense of loss of status, yeah. loss of hope, and but and and the fo- there are, are politicians that manipulate uh, all these grievances. <laughs> What tips it to violence? Because I mean that those conditions can describe many, many countries yeah. around the world that are yeah. not at, in, at exactly. actually fighting a war. They may not yeah. be, you know, very healthy, but yeah. they're not they're not killing one another. Uh, yeah. So so what what what's that final step? Um, that's a great question, and and um, you know I call it the loss of hope, um, and it really it gets back to this notion that most people don't want war. They that you know, they understand that it's gonna be costly. They would prefer to get what they want peacefully. And so what you often see people doing um, as a means to try to avoid war is they'll protest, they'll have pre- peaceful protests, or they will work within the, the system. They will continue to participate in elections, but when the protests have no effect, if if their governments, if if they have no effect on um, convincing the government to, for example, implement policies that they really want, the the far right here in the United States has wanted immigration, illegal the the gov- federal government to crack down on I- illegal immigration and to change our our immigration laws for for decades, and and the government hasn't done that. So if you see that. Um, the government isn't responding, um, you lose hope. You especially are likely to lose hope if you're protesting in whatever manner it is and the government responds really harshly. Um, Mm -hmm. So if you think back to Ruby Ridge or Waco, Waco. I think I think the federal government learned an enormous amount about that. They, They learned that those were essentially protests. It was a form of protest. The government went in and ended up killing, you know, women and children. And and what the extremists then <clears throat> do is they use that to show, you know, at, you know, people who who might be sympathetic to their cause but don't agree with their extreme measures of violence. They use it as evidence that the government really is um, determined. To, to crush them and therefore they have to turn to violence. So that's one. And then again, if you if you are in a, in a democracy and you, you lose a series of elections, um, that's a loss of hope, right? In a system where one person, one vote um, counts, if you can't win elections, if you don't have the votes to win, the system won't work for you anymore. And I actually think the 2020 elections were devastating for the Republican party and for Republicans. Um, <clears throat> they had higher turnout than they have had in decades. They had an amazing ground game that brought out the vote. Um, it, you know, It's not clear that they really could do a whole lot better than that. And they still lost by almost 8 million votes. So if it becomes clear that um, you don't have the numbers to compete effectively in the type of system that you have, then either you have to change the system or if the system isn't going to change in order to maintain your group in power, then again, you step outside the system and then violence becomes one potential means to do that. So how close are we to violence? So in the task force, we have a watch list. Um, And um, groups that have these two factors, or countries that have these two factors get put on a watch list. And um, we know that those countries have about a 4% annual risk of civil war. Okay, that seems very small, but it's not. Um, If you are an anocracy and you're, you're, uh, population is engaging in, in racial and ethnic politics, um, and you don't change that. After 30 years with a four, about a 4% annual risk, you're over 
4%. After 30 years, yeah, 100% risk. So the way I think about it is- so it's 4% a, a year rising. A year, right? exactly. So it's uh, like it's like the compound risk- Compound interest on exactly. civil war. Yeah, so it's <laughs> yeah. like the risks of smoking. If I started smoking today, my risk of dying of lung cancer this year would not be very high. But if I continue to smoke year after year after year, my risk would eventually be quite high. That's where the United States is today. If we continue to have a weak democracy, in fact, if we, if, we can, if we go the other direction and become even weaker, we go deeper into the anocracy zone. And if we have one of our main parties continuing only to, to appeal to one, one um, subset of the population, the white population without broadening its, its tent to be more inclusive, then those two factors will continue and our risk will increase every year. So I want to, I, we've got just uh, about five more minutes before I turn it to the, to the audience. And I do want to ask you uh, uh, so to give us some hopeful things that yeah. we can do yeah. to, to, to turn around. But I guess I, I want to ask though about this, the larger narrative, which Democrats have pervaded for some time, which is demography is destiny. You know, the demography is on our side. The United States is becoming what I call a plurality nation. By 2027, Americans under 30, there will be no white majority. And by sometime in the 2040s, that will be true of all of us. So if you're a, a Republican, a white Republican who feels like, as you say, I'm losing status, and I'm losing, um, you know, I, I'm losing any ability to win in this system because it's simply the straight demography uh, compounded with all these notions about what the country was, right? In my country, I mean, how do you how do you kind of counter that? Given that a those are facts, and yeah. b the Democrats have have relied very heavily on the idea that you know, yes, the more the country is diverse, the, the less uh, the power that white people have as a block, the better off the Democrats will be. So, you know, you, you could be complacent and say, listen, if you, um, you know, let's just uh, let demographics, um, you know, run its course. Um, eventually the Republicans will have to appeal um, to non-whites because the country is becoming non-whites. Um, and, and everything will be okay. Um, I wish that was the case because, you know, we know that the groups that are losing power don't stand by idly. We know that there are extremists within um, the Republican party and within the far right here in this country who, who are planning for civil war, who, who, you know, when they marched in Charlottesville in 2017, one of their main chants was, we will not be replaced. We will not be replaced. And they're not saying, you know, uh, we will not be replaced as, uh, you know, as long as, as we can do that within our democracy. They're saying, we're not gonna be, replace under any circumstances. And so, so again, one, I guess one of the, you said, you know, give us hope. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've interviewed so many people um, who've lived through civil wars and, and I always press them, I'm like, tell me about the, the weeks, the months before violence broke out. You know, tell me when you sense that something was off. And they all say the same thing, they say, we didn't see it coming. You know, I, I look back and I still can't believe it happened. You know, I, you know, now I see that there were red flags, but at the time we were busy, we were going to work. Um, or, you know, you could explain it away or, or to be honest, we didn't, we didn't want to think anymore about it. And then, you know, I, this, I talked to this woman who lived through Sar in Sarajevo and she said, and then one night I'm home with my newborn and the lights went out and I heard machine gun fire in the hills. And, and so, so like the hope, okay, the hope <laughs> is that none of them knew the warning signs. And of course, the extremists who were organizing for battle, the paramilitary um, groups, the, the Serb paramilitary groups that were organizing to lay siege to Sarajevo, they didn't want to be detected. They didn't want people to be paying attention. 
they wanted people to be confused and 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 ignorant of what was happening behind the scenes but but I know, you know, having studied these wars and having served on this task force, I know that we know the warning signs. And, and so if we, can, if we can inform American citizens, if they can be clear-eyed about what the risks are and what's happening, then we actually have time to do something. We have, you know, we have years to, um, I mean, we don't have endless amounts of time, but, but we have time to reform our democracy, to strengthen it. Um, we have, you know, time for the leadership of the Republican Party um, to to take a stand and say, listen, you know, uh, nobody is going to benefit if we continue to go down this path. Um, and, and so, you know, that to me is is what's so, one of the things that's so important is just have people um, recognize what's happening in our country so that there's time to do something. So I'm going to take from that. You do think we have time? We, our first, there's a question from Professor Randall Doyle, uh, who actually asked the question you just answered, sort of saying that in many of the accounts he's read, uh, you know, it, it, people didn't see it coming, as you've just described, and I've heard, heard that as well. And then asking you, you know, do, that given that most Americans don't want to believe this. And as I said, as I read your book, I didn't want to accept your yeah. conclusions. I will say you convinced me. <laughs> I, you know, I, and I thought, yes, you know, we are closer than I want to believe, right? So we, yeah. we deny. Um, and But you, you've said there is time. I guess he says in the next few years, particularly the elections of this year, 2022 and 2024, do you see trouble ahead? So are the we Republican likely to are, slide to violence. Uh, the, the Republican leadership is is pursuing Plan A, and Plan A is how do we um, cement in minority rule in various ways, both at the the uh, state level and at the federal level. How can we um, um, basically craft a system that that disproportionately continues to favor the white Christian rural vote. So they're going to go whole hog um, in that direction. And we're, we're seeing it right now. Um, <clears throat> so that is still where they're thinking, hmm, there's still hope um, in this system. We're going to try to uh, manipulate the system, but they're still kind of working within the system. Um, if they manipulate the system and they still lose, right? You can see how that is when they're just like, wow, we have tried everything. We have tried to, to stack the Supreme Court. We have tried to, um, you know, gerrymander districts. We have, you know, we've done a whole series of things and we're still not able to rule the way we want. Then, then again, the, the more extreme elements were saying, see, we told you so, you know, civil war, is, is you know the only way this is going to um, work is if we burn it all down. Then they start to get more support because because people have tried Plan A and then Plan B um, becomes increasingly attractive. And I'll just say to the audience, it's I mean, you you really do have to buy the book. It opens with a description of the group uh, that planned to kidnap uh, Governor Whitmer in Michigan. And really, you, they were infiltrated and stopped. But it's it's truly chilling. So for, for people who think, no, 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 this, this is exaggerated. Um, we have a very good question from an anonymous attendee that point who points out that um, you're talking about the imperial presidency, yeah. fair enough, all the way back. But he says, or she, um, from what I am seeing, Biden's policies are being easily derailed by just two senators and the filibusters and by the Supreme Court. Is there a danger that the presidency will become too weak? And I agree that right now, I think it's a fair question. Well, I do, I do think if you, if, if democracy is no longer working for you and your group, um, then one of the things you want to do is delegitimize uh, democracy. You want people to believe that that democracy isn't working. You want them to believe that it's not the best system. Um, they shouldn't trust the elections. It's illegitimate. And 
one of the things that will help you make that point is if government actually isn't working. If you could paralyze any, any attempted legislation um, to the point where nothing gets done, and it doesn't matter if there's a Democrat in office or a Republican in office, but if, the, if nothing ever gets done, then you will see more and more Americans say, and we have seen this, the Pew Research Institute does surveys, and they are showing that over time, more and more Americans um, will say that democracy is not the best system. Um, and in fact, there's an even scarier one that, that military rule might be attractive because it would bring law and order and, and efficiency. Um, and of course, this is a message that anti-democratic elements and uh, leaders of, of parties that, that don't want democracy are going to say. So paralysis works for them and they're, they're going to try everything they can to, to stymie to stymie legislation. So there are a couple questions that, that sort of challenge the argument that this is mostly racial or ethnic. So yeah. Karen Pepper asks a, a couple of questions. One where she, she says, you know, what do you do when it's really a majority, uh, you know, where it's, where it's women who are, who are the majority and yet the patriarchy <laughs> keeps them out of power. And then, then more more broadly, that you know, the, she sees the divide as based more on gender than race, uh, and that racism is the door, but gender inequality is the rest of the house. And I just wonder how you <laughs> would respond uh, to that. Oh, this is such a great question. And and actually, if I write another book, um, hopefully my husband isn't listening. If I write another book, it will be on on the gender issue. Um, right now, um, white women, when they've had to, um, and, and this has been historically, and it still continues today, but I think it's going to break down. Um, when they have to choose between their race and their gender, they've been choosing race. Um, so they stick, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, they stick with the, the white males in terms of of voting, there there was a shift in terms of suburban suburban um, white women, um, but still a majority of, of white women are are voting for the Republicans, um, and I I think that's going to shift. Um, uh, you know, I think what we're increasingly seeing, and and the story that people haven't emphasized because race has been so dominant, is that the far right, the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers. Um, the three percenters, um, but especially the Proud Boys. I mean, this is, they're not just um, arguing that America is a white Christian nation. They're saying America should be ruled by white male Christians. It's very misogynistic. And, and when we talk about threat and the loss of status being uh, a reason that many of these groups, not only here, but across the world have organized, um, women are increasingly threatening to men. And, and that's a story that isn't told very much, but it, but it will, will become a big story where, you know, women are now, um, you know, almost 60% of college graduates, 50% um, of all doctors, 50%, well, probably over 50% of all lawyers. Um, they, they tend to have the skills that are best, better suited for a service economy. Um, so in a whole host of different measures, women um, are better placed to do to succeed in a modern economy than uh, than men are and and we know that that um, men's attendance in college um, has been declining um, we don't exactly know why but we know that's true and and you're starting to see um, this rise of I saw a new a new word which was which was really great nativism but that's not exactly it, where it's where it's this um, where you're starting where where men on the extreme are arguing um, that for traditional values, women staying home, having more babies, and again, if if you if you don't want to be replaced, one way to do that is to have white women have more babies, increase the birth rate, and that serves a secondary purpose of keeping women at home and not competing with you for jobs. So, so I actually think that is a, that is an important divide. It, it is a divide that I think we will see more of 
after um, after you know the far right has has gone after what they see as the bigger threat right now, which is um, the non-white population. So, so just to follow up on what you said, that that kind of cultural conservatism is exactly how Steve Bannon made common cause with Putin and Orban and a lot of extreme Catholic conservatives, which yeah. it's very, very much women belong in the home. I mean, yeah. and, Bolsonaro as well, and, and, you know, the evangelical yeah, Christians much in so. Brazil have been quite powerful as well. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the next two qu the questions, again, they're connected and it's a, it, it, they're, they're challenging the racial story, but more on economic grounds. Uh -huh. So one is that really, isn't it more about the, the growing Gini coefficient and yeah. wage gap growth mm -hmm. are being ignored uh, and yeah. that, that uh, the voting preferences break down over those lines. And a similar question, which I'm going to read because I think it's, it, it gets at it in, the, in, in a more vivid way. Uh, from Rayford Kittle or Keitel, Mr. Keitel, um, says, what do Trump supporters want? Anti-immigration, anti-civil rights for minorities, anti-abortion, what else? Sometimes it seems to me they want to humiliate and shove to the back of the line groups they see as having jumped ahead of them in the quest for the American dream. So again, that there's this economic piece yeah. that you know, they're getting ahead and I am not. Yeah. Uh, and, at the, and obviously as inequality <laughs> increases. Yeah, those are again important questions. So, so the early quantitative studies on civil wars um, all found that um, one of the most um, uh, significant factors um, was GDP per capita. So, civil wars did tend to break out in in poor countries, and and that was a powerful result because it's it was so intuitive. And um, all of us who studied civil wars, we didn't know why, right? Why was poverty so important? Um, was it because um, poor people are really unhappy and they're probably also unemployed and they probably have time to become soldiers and fight the government? Or is it because um, poor countries actually are just a proxy for, you know, governments that aren't functioning well and providing services um, and probably don't have really effective security forces and so they can't root out insurgencies. Anyway, so so this dominated the literature for a really long time. And then in 2011, the World Bank um, puts every year it puts out, a, it's called the World Development Report, where they focus on one factor that um, they recognize as um, impeding economic development around the world. And in 2011, their World Development Report was on conflict. And they're like, listen, countries that have civil wars, and we know that lots of developing countries have civil wars, um, their economies just suffer, and then they never come back. And then they tend to have another civil war, and then the economy, and, and it doesn't matter how much development aid we send there, it doesn't make any difference. So they commissioned, um, a study um, from me and from a guy at Stanford named James Fearon. <clears throat> and they said, listen, we want you to, um, you know, to." Uh, he was looking at what um, helped to, um, uh, you know, why civil war started. And they asked me to look at the conflict trap, why countries who have one civil war tend to have another one. And they had new data that we didn't have before. And the data was all about features of government. And they were like, listen, you know, maybe it has something, let's, let's tease out this, you know, poor countries have bad governments um, and, and see if it's really the features of government versus poverty that matters. And both of us independently in our two studies found that when you put in features of, of good governance, like rule of law, like competitive elections, like um, a deep set of executive constraints. The GDP, the poverty var var variable was no longer significant. And so that suggests that <clears throat> the poverty va variable was actually um, um, a proxy for a government that was actually strong and functioning. And, and so, um, yeah, so, you know, why is it that suddenly I'm not talking about GDP that much or poverty or income inequality? It's because um, the studies as, as they've evolved have shown 
that those are too rough. They're not really capturing what's going on and it's these various features. And then the second question, um, <clears throat> which is um, about income inequality, inequality, there have been a couple of studies that have looked at what happens when you have a group that's in political decline. So think about the Sunnis in Iraq. Um, they were thrown out of power when the United States came in. Suddenly they went from being you know, top of the heap, both in the military and in, in the, um, civil service and in government to having no jobs at all. Um, <clears throat> and these studies looked at whether an economic crisis that disproportionately affected that group, whether that tended to proceed um, their organization and the study there, there've only been a couple. So I don't, I, I just want to be a little bit careful about it, about that, but they have found that if political decline coincides with economic decline or a crisis that disproportionately hurts that group, that group is even more motivated. And of course, here in the United States, if you look at the white working class, um, and if you look at how they're doing relative to non whites, in, on a host of measure, education level, employment, life expectancy, marriage rates, whether they own their own homes, um, suicide rates, they have declined, the white working class has declined um, more than Latinos, um, Asians, African-Americans who, who have at, you know, at worst um, maintained a, a steady level in terms of their quality of life. And so economically, it is this group also that's suffering. So we have time for one more question. Uh, and I want to end on a more um, positive note. And I'm sorry for all the people. Uh, there, were, there were many great questions. I was trying to group them. But Marcy Goot asks uh, a question that I hope you'll be able to answer yes mm -hmm. and leave us on a more hopeful note. <laughs> Is there an example of a country that has come back from this stage, the stage we're in now? Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so, you know, I was in college in the, in the 1980s and I tell this story in the book that I was taking a, a class and, and the professor um, was asking, um, we, we were talking about conflict, where in the world we thought the next civil war would happen. And almost everybody said South Africa. Um, and of course, what was happening in South Africa at the time were the Soweto riots. You, you oh, yeah. saw this minority white government, this apartheid regime, increasingly doubling down on, on, on holding on to power. Um, the uh, Blacks in South Africa were increasingly protesting um, and the government was responding with increasingly harsh measures to the point where, where it, you know, they, they, they killed over a hundred um, children protesting in, in Soweto. Um, I mean, it, it just, it was inconceivable that, that the, the vast black majority wasn't eventually going to pick up arms against this, this regime. And it didn't happen. Um, and I, you know, I just think it's such a, <clears throat> it's such a great case. South Africa was an anocracy at the time. Clearly, it had ethnic factions. Um, <clears throat> um, you know, whites were all in in one um, uh, in, in one party, and everybody else was outside of that party. And what happened was was that the business community, um, the white business community, eventually put pressure on the white minority regime to reform. And the reason they did that was not because they had a change of heart or they suddenly became more moral. They did that because economic sanctions were increasingly hurting their bottom line. And they realized that, that they couldn't continue to make profits and have an apartheid regime at the same time. And so they had to choose one or the other. And they eventually um, said, to the apartheid regime, we're no longer going to support you. You must reform. And when, when the apartheid regime no longer had the support of, of the white business community, um, uh, they understood that they were not going to be able to survive. So it's a really great example of a country coming back from the brink. That is terrific. I see Morgan, and uh, I think that means we're both getting the hook. But I like that example, and I like it particularly because you didn't say, so we just need a Nelson Mandela, because that seems like a pretty pretty high demand for American yeah. leadership right now. But the idea of the business community could pay, play 
uh, yeah. pivotal role and has, at least socially, yeah. uh, you, you do see that. So yeah. I'm just going to say again, it's a great book. It's a sobering book, but it's a really engaging read. It's not, this is not a depressing book. It's more like, wow, we, we really have to pay attention. So buy it, read it, uh, give it to your friends. Anne Marie, I so appreciate it. Thank you for this opportunity. It's my pleasure. Uh, and on the behalf of Politics and Pros, I definitely want to thank you, uh, Barbara, for doing this event with us and Anne-Marie for being a great moderator this afternoon. Uh, and I'd also like to thank our audience who's watching out there. Of course, we couldn't do these events without you. Uh, please uh, purchase How Civil War Starts uh, from the store. Uh, the link to purchase it online is right there in the chat. All three of our stores are open for indoor shopping and your patronage is what makes these events possible. Uh, I've also just like to thank you all again and um, have a good Saturday afternoon. Thank you. Thanks. Bye everyone. <laughs>